It's time for Mark Lichtenfeld's Oxford Club Radio, the hardest-hitting half hour about you and your money. And now, here's Mark Lichtenfeld. Welcome to Mark Lichtenfeld's Oxford Club Radio. I am Mark Lichtenfeld. Always amazes me how it works out that way. People create a show called Mark Lichtenfeld's Oxford Club Radio, come to me, ask me if I'd be interested. So I got the nod, and here I am. Uh, We have a big, big show for you today. Jim Rickards will be here. If you're not familiar with Jim Rickards, you should be. Jim is a New York Times bestselling author. He's written the book Currency Wars, The Death of Money, Uh, He is the editor of Strategic Intelligence and Gold Speculator, and he has a new book coming out. Uh, It is called The Road to Ruin, the Global Elite Secret Plan for the Next Financial Crisis. And you're not going to want to miss what he has to say. We're going to talk about what that next financial crisis is and what you can do to protect yourself. So you definitely want to stick around for my conversation with Jim Rickards coming up in just a few minutes. By the way, feel free to subscribe to Oxford Club Radio. It's absolutely free. All you do is go to the website, OxfordClubRadio.com, put in your email address, and you will be automatically subscribed. You'll get the new show every Monday in your inbox automatically. You won't have to go looking for it. So I encourage you to do that. So excited for my next guest. He is uh, an absolute rock star in our world. He is the editor of the Strategic Intelligence Newsletter and Gold Speculator. He is a New York Times bestselling author with his books Currency Wars and The Death of Money and has a new book coming out in just a few weeks, The Road to Ruin, The Global Elite Secret Plan for the Next Financial Crisis. Jim Rickards. Jim, thanks so much for joining us. Thrilled to have you here. And congratulations. The book, I, I looked on Amazon. It's already number one in several categories on Amazon. hasn't even been released yet. Thank you, Mark. It's great to, uh, great to be with you, and uh, thanks for mentioning the book. Yeah, it's, uh, it's coming out about a month, but of course it's available for pre-order on Amazon. And, you know, Amazon has a lot of subcategories, but in a couple important ones, including economics and money, uh, we're ranked number one, and that's competing with books that, that are already in the bookstore. So I'm very pleased to see that we're off to a good start. We're going to uh, um, hopefully get a lot more, uh, a lot more interest as we get closer to the date. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a, a huge hit considering your past track record. And like we said, it's, it's already doing well in, in the pre-orders. Uh, but I do want to ask you, what is the next financial crisis that you're writing about and that people need to be prepared for? Well, it's a, uh, really a continuation of uh, two other crises, uh, and I talk about these in the book. I have a, uh, a series of three, uh, 1998, 2008, and what I call 2018, uh, bearing in mind two, 2018 is not a, a, a firm date. This is something that could happen tomorrow. But um, in 1998, of course, you had the Russian default and the uh, collapse of the hedge fund long-term capital management. Uh, and I happen to know a lot about that. I actually uh, was there and then negotiated that bailout uh, up against the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and all that. Uh, we were just hours away from shutting every stock and bond market in the world. That's not an exaggeration. That's actually where we were. If the money hadn't changed hands, if that $4 billion hadn't moved in, uh, every market in the world would have been shut down. That's how dangerous things were. But it, it didn't happen. Uh, the money changed hands, and uh, things, life went on. Same thing in 2008. We were uh, days away from the sequential collapse of every major bank in the world. We had already seen uh, Bear Stearns, Lehman, AIG, Fannie, Freddie. They had all collapsed. Uh, the thing had been patched together. But then it was going to be Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Citi. And so, so again, uh, within 10 years, we had come that close to shutting down the entire system. But both times, we, didn't, we did not solve the problems. In 1998, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street. Now come forward 2018, none of the problems have been solved. The two big to fail banks are bigger. Uh, they have a larger percentage of the banking assets. They have much larger derivatives books. Everything that was dangerous in 08 is more dangerous today. It's been eight years since the last one, Mark, and that's really the point. It's not like they happen every eight years like clockwork, mm-hmm. but that's about the tempo. Um, 1987, uh, the stock market fell 20% in a single day. October 19th, 1987. We're coming up on the 20th anniversary of that, by the way. Uh, sorry, 30th anniversary. Um, and uh, that would be the equivalent of 4,000 Dow points today. 1994, the, t- the 
the uh, tequila crisis in Mexico, the one after another. So no one should be surprised if this happens tomorrow. But here's the difference, and this is really the point of the book. Every time the system has come close to collapse, it's a panic. And in a panic, everybody wants their money back. And so far, the government has just printed the money Mm -hmm. and handed it out. The next time is going to be different. They're not going to print the money. It's going to be bigger than the central banks. They're going to lock down the system. You're not going to be able to get your money. And and why is that? Why couldn't the central banks just print more money and shovel more money at the problem? Because when we went into the last crisis in 08, the Federal Reserve balance sheet was about $800 billion. They printed over $3 trillion, about $3.4 trillion to be exact. But that's in addition to guaranteeing every bank deposit in America, guaranteeing every money market fund in America, doing tens of trillions of dollars of swaps with the European Central Bank because they can't print dollars, but they needed them. Now, if somehow the Fed had got their balance sheet back to $800 billion, they had gone up to $4 trillion and then back down to $800 billion or, or even $1 trillion, I'll cut them a break, I, I'd be the first one to say, nice job, guys. You know, you, you bailed out the system, you got back to normal, and you're ready for the next one. But that's not what happened. They did bail out the system, but they never got back to normal. That balance sheet is still $4 trillion. So what are they going to do the next time? Go to $8 trillion, $12 trillion? Now, legally they could. I want to be clear on that. And I run into people all the time. They go, hey, why not? You know, party on. Uh, let's just uh, print another $4 trillion. In my view, that's not sustainable. But they will pass an invisible confidence boundary, a point at which people simply lose confidence in the system. They say, you know what, I don't know what's going on here. I don't understand it, but uh, get me out of here. Get me... Uh, some land, some gold, some silver, some fine art, you know, water, natural resources, tangible assets. Just get me out of this crazy paper money system because that's what it will be at that point. And the other factor is the elites know this also. And the subtitle of the book uh, is the, the Global Elite Secret Plan. This is, all, this is already baked in the pie. In other words, they're not going to have to pass any laws. There's not going to be any TARP legislation. Uh, very few people know that the United States has been operating under a state of emergency since September 2001, it was declared by President Bush. But it has to be renewed annually by the president, and both Bush and Obama for the last 16 years have renewed that state of emergency. So we're only one phone call from martial law. Again, I document all this in the book. It's not, you know, kind of made-up uh, fantasy stuff. Uh, it's all there. Uh, another development very few people are aware of, um, money market funds used to be treated as the equivalent of cash. They changed that law, literally, it goes into effect this week, uh, but it's a result of a couple-year regulatory process. Now, money market funds can suspend redemptions, exactly like hedge funds. So people think, you know, I've got money in the money market fund, I can just call my broker, sell my units, money will be in my bank account tomorrow. No, in the next crisis, those money market funds are going to suspend redemptions. Now they'll say, well, we're not stealing your money, it's only temporary, Uh, give us a few days to sort things out, we'll get back to you. But the shock is going to be, you will not be able to get your money they can reprogram ATM so you only get $300 a day for gas and groceries. They can shut the banks. By the way, all these things have happened before, and I also document this in the book. How many people know that in, uh, from uh, July to November 1914, the New York Stock Exchange was shut down for five months? In 1933, every bank in the country was closed by executive order. And all these laws are still on the book. So uh, the difference between the next crisis and the last two is the last time they printed the money, the next time they're going to say, sorry, you can't get your money. And then we go on in the book to say, well, what are the things you can do today to prepare for that, to preserve your wealth? Well, there are a couple things everyone can do. I do uh, feel that um, money in the bank, again, your money in the bank is not money. It's an unsecured liability of the bank. It's basically an IOU from the bank. People think they have money, but, but they don't. Uh, but that up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars that's the insured amount so i would not i don't want to alarm people if you have fifty thousand dollars in cash in the bank uh... and it's fdic insured they'll find a way to make that good I, i'm not as uh, nearly as confident in money market funds and uninsured deposits i think those are very much at risk but uh, up to two hundred fifty you're okay it's good to have some cash physical cash uh... it's hard to get believe it or not without being <laughs> reported to the government they'll treat you like a drug dealer or a terrorist but uh, for legitimate citizens, you are entitled to, to some. So it's good to have, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars. It's almost like having a flashlight and batteries. You know, I, I live in an area where we're prone to get hurricanes, and you know, we keep water, flashlight, and batteries yep. just in case. So it's good to have some cash. I recommend a ten percent allocation to physical gold. Um, I like American Gold Eagles. By the way, I'm not a I'm not a, a salesman. Uh, I don't get any commissions on gold. So, uh, but I do recommend it. Um, uh, American Gold Eagles are a good way to hold it. Uh, you know, beyond that, if you are in the stock market, I'd, look, I'd favor 
things in, in natural resources, water, oil, things like that that are robust to inflation. So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not one of these people who uh, says, you know, go live in a cave with canned goods and ammo. I, I think we'll, this crisis will come, we'll wake up, we'll still be standing, but you do need to prepare. And, that, and one of the things I've read that you've said about gold is not to store it in a bank vault, correct? Correct, because if the banks are closed, what good will do? In other words, you, you put your, your gold in a safe deposit box in a bank, and then in a panic, they close the banks. And by the way, this is a good example of what uh, scientists, what I call a conditional correlation, meaning normally you can walk into the bank anytime you want and get whatever's in your safe deposit box. Mm -hmm. But there's a correlation between the time you want your gold the most and the time the banks are closed. <laughs> Those two are the same thing. It's going to be in a full-blown financial panic when they close the banks. That's when you're going to want your gold. So don't put it in the bank because you, you won't be able to get it when you need it. There's a lot of uh, safe non-bank storage around. Uh, there are reputable, uh, you know, secure logistics firm, you know, Brinks, Loomis, Dunbar. Uh, there are also smaller firms. Uh, you know, just make sure they're reputable. They've been around. They've got insurance. Uh, get references. You know, do your homework. But uh, that's a, that's a good way to store gold. I'd like to move on a little bit because I would love your thoughts on the election. Is are, are the results going to impact this financial crisis? Does it matter if it's Hillary or Donald Trump? Yeah, I think it matters a lot. Uh, I think it matters in terms of policy. Uh, it's, un it's unfortunate that we're not talking about policy. We seem to be talking about every mm -hmm. you know personal. Uh, physical, mental, uh, behavioral, <laughs> peccadillo we can find, but it would be nice to talk about policy. But um, uh, here's, uh, here's what's interesting to me, and I'm like, I don't get into uh, you know, endorsements. I've got my opinion. Uh, everyone's got theirs. Uh, yeah, I respect that. That's the great thing about our country, and I'll vote, and I hope everyone else votes too. But uh, what I'm looking at is the market, the interaction between the electoral outcome and the markets. And here's what's interesting. Right now, the markets are priced for Hillary, meaning they are they're priced for a Hillary victory to the point of 80, 90 percent. Mm -hmm. She might win, uh, but if she wins, that means nothing's going to happen to the market because it's already priced in. You're not going to get a big Hillary rally. It's almost as if the rally is already here. Mm -hmm. If Trump wins, you're probably going to get uh, you hit an air pocket, and the stock market could drop immediately uh, at least 5 percent, maybe more. This is very similar to Brexit, what happened in the U.K. The, the market was priced for... You know, they had a vote between whether they would remain in the EU, the European Union, or leave the EU. Those were the two camps, you know, remain and leave. And I watched it closely. The market was completely priced for remain. Sterling was $1.50, gold was 12.60. They were betting on remain. Well, well leave won. Uh, and that was not foreseen really by, by anybody. That was one of the things we were putting on the table, I was putting on the table. So sterling dropped from $1.50 to $1.30 in like two hours. That was a 14% drop, the biggest one-day drop in sterling. Gold went up $100 an ounce from 12.60 to 13.60. Now it's backed off since then, but uh, you know, and it traded around uh, 13.30 for three months, uh, July, August, and September. So you had these again. I call them like hitting air pockets, and they can go either way. They can be up or down. So um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the, if Hillary wins, it's just more of the same, and I wouldn't expect anything to change in the markets um, until December when the Fed raises rates. That's a headwind for stocks. But if Trump wins, you could hit this air pocket. But then what's really interesting is that that's kind of a gut reaction, knee-jerk reaction. But then if he wins, people say, well, you know, he, he wants to cut taxes and cut regulation and spend money and build infrastructure. I mean, nobody, nobody will admit it. The elites will not admit it. But that's actually their plan. They want infrastructure sp spending, larger deficits. So nobody wants to say a kind word for Trump, but his program is a lot closer mm -hmm. to what economists are recommending to get the economy moving. So then the stocks might bounce back on that. So you might see an immediate drop and a bounce back. So I think it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty wild. So uh, short answer to your question, Mark, yes, it does make a difference. Uh, and, and you talked about the, how it could affect the markets. How about their policies as, as far as these crises that you're predicting? Uh, well, Hillary's very predictable. She's a she's a member of this elite that I describe in the book. They, you know, they get together at Davos and the Aspen Ideas Festival and the Milken Institute and the IMF meeting. They all hang out with each other. They all know each other. They make deals in private dinner parties uh, on the sidelines of these big you know G20 conferences. There's a BRICS conference going on in India right now as we're speaking. So she's, she's a member of the club. By the way, all this business about, you know, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, it's all for show at the elite level. I'm not saying that's true at the local level, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying that it's just a rotating elite. So it's not really, 
Democrat versus Republican or liberal versus conservative. It's the elites versus everybody else. That's the way to understand it. And Hillary's one of them, so I've got a pretty good read on her. Trump is more of a wild card. Now, he's certainly, he's certainly elite in the sense that he has, you know, he's a billionaire and he lives in Palm Beach and flies around in a private jet, but he's not really a member of the club. He doesn't, he's, he, he doesn't have a whole, he has a lot of acquaintances, not a whole lot of friends. He seems to spend most of his time with his family, fairly closed circle. He doesn't hang out in all these places that I just described. And that's one of the reasons they hate him so much, because he's, He's like the guy who shows up at the club and, you know, cut off some flip-flops and you're supposed to be wearing a suit or a dress. So, um, but, he's, uh, but he's smart, and it'll, and it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I would expect he would surround himself with some fairly good advisors to fill in the blanks, so to speak, on the things where he's not an expert. But, uh, so with her, uh, I think you get more of the same, um, you know, more Janet Yellen's, more money printing, more... Um, uh, you know, kind of ineffective policy, the same bad policies we've had for, uh, you know, this is the uh, between the Bush um, mm-hmm. uh, recession and the uh, the Obama uh, depression, because we've had depressed growth for eight years. I would just expect more of the same. Gotcha. Trump, uh, much more of a wild card. And, and uh, unfortunately, Jim, we have to leave it there. We're up against the clock, but uh, I'm so glad that uh, you came on with us to chat. Uh, great stuff. Best of luck with the book, and uh, let's check back in with you uh, maybe uh, first half of next year. Great. Thanks, Mark. That's Jim Rickards. He's the editor of Strategic Intelligence, Gold Speculator, uh, New York Times bestselling author, and the new book, The Road to Ruin, The Global Elite Secret Plan for the Next Financial Crisis. You don't want to miss that book. Pick up your copy or pre-order it, I should say, at Amazon today. Uh, that will do it for us this week. My thanks to Curtis Daniels, Jim Rickards, Kevin Cossack, Colleen Hill, all of you for listening. We'll be back same time next week. Again, OxfordClubRadio.com, and you can subscribe for free. You can also check me out on Twitter at Stocks and Boxing, Stocks, letter N like Nancy, Boxing. Until next week, hope your longs go up and your shorts go down. I'm Mark Lichtenfeld. (laughs) 